Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Suzanne Nossel. She's the CEO of PEN America, the leading human rights and free expression organization. She's a prominent voice on issues of free expression in the United States and around the globe. We speak a lot about the First Amendment and how special it is to protect our free speech. We think about it as being essential and even fundamental to our democracy. But how does it actually work in practice? What are the limitations when it comes to hateful speech? The president has his own First Amendment rights. He's also a citizen. So he can needle a journalist. He can call someone out by name. There's not much we can do to constrain him from expressing himself in that way. That's the First Amendment. But what the president can't do, but has done, is to mobilize the power of the federal government to retaliate against coverage that he does not like. So when the president withdraws a hard pass, a White House press credential from a journalist in retaliation for harsh questioning, that is the action of government to inhibit freedom of speech. We'll be talking about how freedom of speech does and does not work, how we can be smart consumers of the news, and why we should all subscribe to local newspapers. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Before we start, I'd like to just read what the First Amendment actually says. Quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances, unquote. What aspects of the First Amendment are most relevant to the daily lives of Americans today? Well, I'd point to a couple of things. The First Amendment encompasses really four distinct freedoms. There is freedom of opinion and freedom of worship, freedom of belief. So what you sort of hold in your head and your heart and that which is most personal to you, your ability to have an opinion and hold an opinion. Then there's the freedom of speech, so the freedom to say, to write, to express, essentially voice your ideas and your views. Third is freedom of assembly, so the freedom to not just talk to others, but to gather others together, whether it's a, a campaign on behalf of an issue or a protest, to express those views and put weight behind those views, the collective weight of a mass of people behind those views. And then finally, the freedom to petition the government for redress of grievances. So to bring your concerns directly to those in power and those authorized to address them. So that's the first thing I would highlight. The The second thing I think is essential to understand is the first part of the amendment, which is Congress shall make no law. So what that does is constrain the ability of government to enact laws and measures and policies that would infringe upon those four freedoms. So Congress can make no law that's been extended by courts to apply to the executive branch, to apply to the states and city governments, local governments. And it's a broad prohibition on the government's ability to restrict speech, but it does not apply to private actors. It doesn't apply to Facebook or Twitter or a school, a private university, for example. Let's go with something slightly more formal first, just because I think when people think about the press, people don't really think about Facebook. So what does freedom of press really mean in actuality when it comes to, let's say, what we see in the newspaper? Or I guess we can talk about what we see now on social media. What's the difference there? How does freedom of the press play out in these places? Well, press freedom distinctly is not something that's called out in the Constitution, apart from the First Amendment. So press freedom cases hinge on the language of the First Amendment. But the courts have found that there is a special role for the press in our society. They've recognized the importance of a free press to upholding our democracy, holding government accountable, informing people, providing a vehicle for enlightenment and debate on important issues. They have held in certain circumstances that there are protections afforded to the press that go beyond 
what ordinary citizens might have, including, for example, the ability to protect unidentified sources that are used and relied upon in reporting. How is press freedom challenged? One of the most classic ways is through a defamation lawsuit. So somebody reads a story about them that they believe is unfair, untrue, unfavorable. They can bring a suit and challenge the newspaper or media outlet that has reported that story and ask for damages to be paid for the harm to their reputation. And courts have upheld a very high standard, which makes it very difficult to bring that kind of a case. You have to find that the news outlet in question knew or should have known that the information was false and that they deliberately punished it despite that knowledge. So if they made an error, if it was even kind of negligent that they didn't properly look into it, they will not be held liable for defamation. That combination of rulings has made the U.S.'s standard for First Amendment protection really the most broad in the world. We protect more speech than any other country. For example, in Britain, it's much easier to bring a libel or defamation claim there than it is here in this country. So speaking of defamation, this is not exactly a defamation suit, but when the president or other elected officials call the press fake news, what is the effect on freedom of speech? What we see now with the president directly attacking credible news sources, denigrating individual journalists, is trying to discredit credible news coverage. It's really unprecedented. I, I don't think that's something that the framers of the Constitution necessarily foresaw when they were putting together the Bill of Rights. But we do have a president who is engaging in that. And it's complicated because the president has his own First Amendment rights. He's also a citizen. So he can needle a journalist. He can call someone out by name. He can say that he dislikes the Washington Post or the New York Times. He's free to do that. There's nothing we can do, even if we feel his claims are ill-motivated, that he has a vendetta, that he's wrong or misled. There's not much we can do to constrain him from expressing himself in that way. That's the First Amendment. But what the president can't do, but has done, is to mobilize the power of the federal government to retaliate against coverage that he does not like. So when the president withdraws a hard pass, a White House press credential from a journalist in retaliation for harsh questioning, that is the action of government to inhibit freedom of speech. So we talked about the text of the First Amendment, which says Congress shall make no law. That had been interpreted more broadly to apply not just to Congress, but to the executive branch, to individual government officials. The president's a government official. So he can't take an action that uses the power of the federal government to punish speech and to deter speech. And really, the deterrence element is important because when he does these things, whether it's revoking a hard pass or retaliating against a news outlet like CNN or the Washington Post, the aim, I believe, is to deter future negative coverage. He wants journalists to operate on the premise that if they cross him, he's going to come after them. That retributive impulse, I think, is something we have not seen before and something that quite clearly contravenes the First Amendment. What are the repercussions of dampening free speech, or in this case, specifically negative reporting, potentially? We see disturbing ripple effects from this behavior. We see officials at the state and the city level having their own retributive impulses, going after journalists, excluding journalists from state houses who they believe are you know, too liberal or perhaps too conservative or otherwise don't meet with the approval of those in charge. We had an incident of a, a member of Congress body slamming a reporter who asked tough questions on the campaign trail. So there's this kind of overt hostility toward the press that has been unleashed. We see the president at his rallies goading his supporters into hostile sentiment and in some cases action toward journalists, cameramen, media outlets are having to assign bodyguards for their journalists when they cover Trump rallies because he 
has mobilized his supporters into believing that they are, in his words, the enemy of the American people. So it's really kind of a, a very disturbing situation. And for somebody like myself, who works in an international organization, we know these tactics well. They come straight out of the authoritarian playbook. It, it was always the case until recently that when authoritarian leaders around the world would menace journalists, jail journalists, brutalize journalists in different ways, the United States that you'd rely on to speak out against that and to be a, a forceful voice on behalf of press freedom and free expression. So we have ceded that moral leadership. And in fact, what we see is copycat measures by people like Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines, who I believe feel emboldened to take even more liberties in pushing back against an assertive press because President Trump is seen to have legitimized that. If, it, if it's legitimate in Washington, you know, why not in Manila or in other capitals around the world? So it's really distressing to see that withering away of American moral leadership on free speech issues. Yeah, it is. I mean, just to add to what you're saying, according to your own reporting, the number of journalists worldwide jailed on charges of reporting what their persecutors deemed fake news has tripled in the last year. So speaking of ceding the ground, where are the limits of freedom of speech? Like the president has the freedom of speech to say this is fake news. But at what point is it an abuse? You know, in, in the case of the president, it's an abuse when he mobilizes the machinery of the federal government to actually retaliate and exact a reprisal against speech. That's where he crosses the line into action that contravenes the Constitution. And what about hate speech? I prefer the term hateful speech because okay. we don't really have a definition of hate speech. Hate okay. speech people use in so many different ways. But basically, under the Constitution, hateful speech is protected. One of the most thorny and controversial aspects of free speech today is sort of this sense that hateful speech in this current kind of political and social environment has been let loose and people are now harshly criticizing or denigrating immigrants or the undocumented or women or people of color. What do we do about it? Really one of the most difficult aspects of defending free speech today is that it's apparent that speech can be harmful and that this kind of speech is having a negative effect on social relations. It spreads on social media. It can radicalize individuals. So there's no question that speech can be harmful. Most of the speech, unless it meets one of those categories of exception to the First Amendment, is protected legally. And so the question then becomes, what do we do about this speech? How do we address the problem of this kind of speech without contravening the Constitution? That's a very good question. I think one of the things that is really difficult to parse as an everyday person who maybe doesn't read every single newspaper is figuring out what is false news, like truly false news, you know, just lies and or damaging things in the public sphere, published just to get us to change our opinion or, you know, pollute our minds for lack of better expression. What do you think we should be doing as like an everyday consumer of news? We at PEN America did major report on what we called fraudulent news and disinformation back in 2017 after the 2016 election when a lot of us woke up to the fact that there had been systematic campaigns to propagate false ideas and information in insidious ways. And we documented and analyzed the threat that this posed to free expression and democracy. Almost all this disinformation and fraudulent news is protected by the First Amendment, right? Because it's not incitement to imminent violence. It's not necessarily defamatory. It's not harassing. It's just misleading. But under the First Amendment, you know, you are allowed to lie. We've always had hyperbole and advertising. We nonetheless recognize this poses a threat to free speech and open discourse. Free speech is about having a polity that can debate, that can sort fact from falsehood, that can reason, you know, where information and insights come to light and can surface. And through that deliberation, you can 
form sound policies. People can decide who to vote for. You can resolve social problems. And when the discourse becomes polluted by false information and nefarious campaigns that may originate from a foreign government, there are campaigns coming out of Moscow you know, where someone's posing to be Black Lives Matter in Texas, and it's completely misleading. We saw that and continue to see that as a very real danger. We see some of the effects now. Americans are just tuning out. They have become kind of inured to the news. They don't know what to believe. It's a combination of actual disinformation and propaganda campaigns. And then the president's weaponizing of the term fake news. He uses the term fake news to refer to real news. We have now a significant subsection of our population who are his supporters who have come to believe that, in fact, real news is fake news. And so our information ecosystem is becoming bifurcated, where you sort of have half or a little more of the country focusing on a few outlets that they believe are credible and that I think do practice serious uh, and uh, fact-based and rigorous journalism. And then you have a segment that is tuning into other outlets where you know, the story that's being told is completely different. And so we are very concerned about this kind of erosion in the common facts base that undergirds a democracy. Yes, I'm worried about it too. So what would be your advice for people who can't tell the difference? If they wanted to educate themselves truly on an issue or something that's being reported, where should they go? How should they think about what they're reading and how should they approach it? First of all, we need to do much more as a society to equip young people in particular to be informed, discerning news consumers. You know, we teach our kids to analyze short stories. We should also be teaching our kids to analyze news stories, to look at, you know, where is the byline from? Where was the story filed? Who is this reporter? Where is it being published? Is it a serious news outlet? What does this outlet claim that it's doing? Who's behind it? So I believe that in every school, we should, as part of primary and secondary education, we should be teaching people how to swim in this ocean of information. For those of us who are kind of trying to navigate this in the here and now and may not have had that education, I'd say a couple of things. One is reading broadly and reading from different kinds of outlets and even tuning into outlets that you may be at odds with ideologically, and I do this, I'll I'll tune on to a little bit of Fox News just to understand how are they telling the news of the day and what kinds of messages are other people getting about these stories. But for everybody, I think looking at a breadth of news sources, looking at whether sources are considered serious, you know, are these people doing actual reporting? Do they have a reporter at the Pentagon who is talking to officials and getting the story, or are they just rehashing or reprising, knowing the difference between an opinion column and a reported story? You know, one of the most damaging things, I think, is on cable news, you'll see these panels of talking heads, and there'll be six talking heads, and you know, maybe one or two of them are reporters who actually have been investigating and can bring some new information to light, and then the rest are pundits, and a couple of the pundits often are from a political campaign or a political organization, and It's all mixed together. If you're just an ordinary viewer, how would you really know the difference between what those participants in the conversation are bringing to the table? And I think it blurs the line between news and opinion to a point where the value of both is undercut. For sure. Well, to your earlier point, to just bring it back together, that we are inured with all of this information. Much of it is not even differentiated between opinion and facts. So is there a way back for our society where we can have better information, better discourse as a result of better information? Yeah, I mean, one of the problems is that our information ecosystem has become so fragmented because you now can get your information from any one of tens of thousands of different websites. We used to live in a world with three major television networks and each community had its own few handful of daily papers and that world is gone. The breadth of sources of information is so fragmented that when information is false, very often the purveyors of it are able to target exactly who they want. I think the answer in the long term 
does lie in the news consumer and building a generation of news consumers who are better equipped to understand what they're reading, to ferret out credible news sources and be able to make their own judgments. I wouldn't advocate empowering the government to shut down spurious news sites. That's not something that's permitted under the First Amendment. I I don't want the government making those judgments. I mean, we put the power in the hands of this administration. You know, who knows? They shut down science websites on climate change. So we can't go that route. I think there are a series of technical measures that social media platforms can take to try to elevate fact-based content, inform people where information is provably false. But the other piece of it is is empowering and equipping the news consumer to be more discerning. Definitely, I want to be a more discerning news consumer, but that puts a lot of work onto the consumer as opposed to the purveyor of the news. And what you're saying is that we can't actually demand veracity. Well, we can demand it, but I don't want to empower the government to enforce it. We've always had fake news, for example, the supermarket tabloids, which would have stories about aliens or this celebrity, you know, things that are manifestly false. But the way I think we dealt with that as a society was, you know, there was a sense of stigma around those outlets and you kind of knew to take them for what they were worth. Some of that sense of discernment has been lost and, and needs to be restored. At a societal level, there's nothing wrong with trying to reinforce the importance of fact-based, credible information and to disavow and devalue propaganda and misinformation. There's a debate right now about Facebook's news feed. They've said Breitbart is going to be part of that. And there's been a big outcry by civil society saying, you know, hey, listen, look at the stories they publish. They don't belong as part of a, a program that's purporting to be about credible news. I think that's perfectly legitimate for civil society organizations, individual citizens to cry foul. Yes, totally agree. What can we do as private citizens to both protect free speech and also somehow bridge the divide that we are in today? I think we need to stand up for the right of individuals to voice unpopular ideas. It's become kind of hard to do that because you get a lot of blowback, whether it's online, on Twitter, in the classroom, in print. If you articulate a controversial position, you can subject yourself to death threats in this environment. And yeah, that really chills our discourse. And I think it's up to all of us to defend the right to voice unpopular opinions and to be able to say, I don't agree with her, but I defend her right to say that. I also think it's important to be reasoned, fact-based, and not vitriolic in how you communicate. When you denigrate other people, when you veer into slurs and hateful speech, you may be protected by the First Amendment, but you're dragging the First Amendment down, and you're actually playing right into the hands of those who would like to see it cut back because they believe it's too protective and that that kind of speech is too destructive. There's a whole series of things that we need to do to kind of reset free speech for our diverse, digitized, and divided society. For citizens supporting those who are doing that work, whether it's buying a newspaper, being a subscriber, one of the big problems is that the model that used to underwrite, particularly local news, but also national news in print, was display advertising. You know, those days are over, and we've seen a decimation in local news. We've seen 20% of local news outlets shutter their doors. We've seen a 50% reduction in the size of reporting staffs at local news outlets. So I would encourage people to subscribe to the newspaper. That's the way you keep it alive. That's the way you ensure that you have that reporting to rely on and to support the organizations that are on the front lines of defending these freedoms. All good advice. Including Pen America. Including Pen America. Well, speaking of Pen America, I was just going to ask you, what is it that you do to support free speech and have a healthier ecosystem of information out there? We do a whole series of things. We work both here in the U.S. and around the world. We work on behalf of imperiled writers. When somebody gets picked up, arrested, prosecuted, jailed for the crime of expressing themselves, we advocate on their behalf. We monitor their case. We intercede with governments. We mobilize other advocates and writers. 
we have a pretty good track record of being able to secure the freedom of those writers who face imprisonment. And then, you know, here in this country, a whole series of issues. We've sued the president of the United States under the First Amendment because of his acts of retaliation against journalists and the media. We are in the lead in fighting back against online harassment, which has become a huge source of both self-censorship and kind of censoriousness online. So if you are writing or tweeting about controversial topics, you are exposing yourself to opprobrium and outrage and anger and menacing. What we see is particularly for women and people of color online, they are retreating and pulling back because it feels genuinely dangerous. And so we developed a very comprehensive suite of tools that we call our online harassment field manual, and it's available online on our website at pen.org. I'll touch on just our work on campus free speech, which has been a huge issue and it has become a daily wellspring of controversy. You know, but it's dozens and dozens of campuses across the country dealing with issues of hateful speech, deplatforming, so controversial speakers being invited to come to campus to give their views and then being shut down or shouted down by students, professors in the classroom who say something that is objectionable and then may face disciplinary charges or even be fired. And our goal with that work kind of addresses the intersection between the drive to make college campuses more diverse, equal, and inclusive. On the other side, the imperative of sustaining robust protections for academic freedom and free speech. And it's our view that those dual obligations of the university can and must coexist. Well, you do a lot of work everywhere. (laughs) That's very impressive. What is the source of your passion? Oh, for me? Yeah. Well, I kind of got introduced to activism as a child during the movement to free Jews who were being held in the Soviet Union and were not able to practice their religion and were not able to leave and lived often under very difficult circumstances, had constrictions on their employment and their ability to be voices within society. And there was a big movement here in the United States to support those individuals. And as a child, I got involved in that and went to some marches down Fifth Avenue to the United Nations and organized a club in my high school. And we sort of got to know these dissidents by name. And I think that feeling of standing up with others and particularly being part of those marches and those mobilizations and then actually seeing it come to fruition when the laws were changed and many of those families were allowed to go free after many years and some came to the U.S. and there was a chance to get to know them. So watching the power of a people's movement unfold and yield results through political mobilization I think for me, sort of kindled a passion about what can be done in the human rights field. Awesome. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? Youth. You know, what I would say is overall that youth reflect more progressive, inclusive, future-oriented ideas, whether it's about climate change, race relations, gender relations and the role of women, progressive policies in society, the importance of giving everybody an opportunity. We see that youth embrace those ideas. So I feel like year after year as our electorate is gradually turning over, it is moving in the right direction. I think it's extremely important to engage with youth because Right now, the First Amendment and free speech is getting a bad name for the reasons we discussed and because of the rise in hate speech. And so it's extremely important to connect with youth to make clear that the struggles they are waging for, whether it's social justice or criminal justice or environmental justice, are grounded in freedom of speech. If you didn't have freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, those movements wouldn't have been able to be stood up and wouldn't be the voices that they are. So it's extremely important to engage with youth and get them to see why the First Amendment is integral to their struggles, because I think ultimately they do represent the hope. Perfect. Thank you very much.
Suzanne's closing words are an important reminder about how the First Amendment bolsters democracy. All activism, advocacy, or political movement is grounded in freedom of speech. We need to be vigilant to defend the rights of those who trade in hateful rhetoric because censorship or government regulation will inevitably be meted out unfairly. In a way, it turns out that hateful speech is perhaps not the bigger problem overall. It's fraudulent news. For citizens, it's not an easy lift to discern what's true and what's not. It's not obvious to separate the pundit from the straight journalist in a panel discussion on television. And going to the primary source to double-check is often not convenient. But we should still demand that news outlets report the truth. And to tie this back with the first episode of this season on the forces that support democracy, Louise Dubé had it right when it comes to high-quality education. We need to be proactive in teaching our school-aged children how to analyze whether they are seeing real reporting, falsehoods, or propaganda, or an opinion piece. Next week, our guest is Michael Baranowski. He's a political scientist at Northern Kentucky University and a co-host of a terrific podcast called The Politics Guys that features bipartisan dialogue. We discuss how civil discourse strengthens our democracy and improves our lives, as well as the state of our institutions, some straight-up politics and impeachment, and last but not least, civic engagement. What I really want to get across to people is that if you go into these conversations with a little bit of intellectual humility, which is not to say you're just willing to give up your beliefs, but understanding that you don't maybe have all the answers and a willingness to really listen to the other person, but putting a little bit of trust in their motives, I think you can get a long way and you can find that sometimes you actually agree on more things than you would have thought. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for listening to Future Hindsight. The executive producer and host of this program is Mila Atmos. The audio producer and music composer is Peter Fedak. The associate producer is Miriam Zumbu. Additional production by Brooke Sayan. Listen to us online at futurehindsight.com or your favorite streaming service.